Hello and welcome. I'm Tom Palmer. Tonight I'm speaking with Dr. Peter Glick of the Pacific Institute. Dr. Glick, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, I, we're here to talk about water and all its uses and the billion people that don't have access to clean drinking water. Uh, your foundation is 25 years old now. Uh, would you like to talk about how it was founded? Sure. I'm the director of something called the Pacific Institute in Oakland. Uh, the Institute is a nonprofit independent research and policy group. We look at the connections between environmental issues, economic development, and international security and policy. Uh, much of what we do is freshwater related, but, but not everything. We look pretty broadly at global and local environmental problems. And we were founded 25 years ago because there were very few places at the time and, and still today that really take a comprehensive interdisciplinary look at these problems of the environment and economic development and, and policy. Uh, we like to think that we look at science and the public interest. How can we explore the connections between some of these major global problems and at the same time find what we hope are sustainable solutions? So you author papers and... We, we do research, we do some field work, we author papers. More recently, been, we've been working on smartphone technology and how it can be useful for local communities in Indonesia. Uh, we do briefings and policy analysis. We do testimony before Congress and legislators. We do uh, talks for the public. Um, it's, it's really an effort to do science in the public interest. One of your more recent books was uh, Bottled and Sold, all about bottled water. And when you came in, I offered you some water and you had pointed out to me that it was bottled and that you'd prefer something out of a tap. Um, can you want to talk about your book? Sure. Uh, bottled water is sort of a strange story, it's sort of a strange thing. We, we at the Institute have worked on water issues for a long time, on the whole range of water issues from basic needs, uh, the failure to meet basic needs in developing countries, the billion people without access to safe drinking water. Uh, we work on conflict over water, we work on the impacts of climate change on water, and during the work that we've been doing, it became increasingly apparent that more and more people, even in a country like the United States, which has a pretty remarkable tap water system, were drinking bottled water. And, and that led to my thinking about what is bottled water? Why do we drink bottled water? What's the story behind marketing of bottled water? Uh, and that in turn led to this book, Bottled and Sold, the story behind our obsession with bottled water. And I look at the whole story really behind the strange case of bottled water. Why, why do we drink it? What, what are we thinking? What, what's behind the companies that are involved? What are some of the strange advertising stories that have come up about bottled water? Is it really any better in quality? Uh, and partly because of my work on that book, I've become pretty sensitive to, to bottled water. Uh, yeah. we live in, I live in Berkeley, uh, a place that has incredibly good drinking water from the tap at incredibly low cost. Uh, there's no reason for anybody in the Bay Area to be drinking bottled water, the, perhaps in California to be drinking bottled water with, with a few exceptions. And uh, so everywhere I go, I'm both offered bottled water and find myself turning it down. So a lot of that marketing was a fear campaign about tap water? I, I think people drink bottled water because we're afraid of tap water. Uh, and partly we've been made afraid of tap water because of advertising on the part of bottled water companies. Uh, it's harder and harder to find public water. It's hard to find a public drinking water fountain these days, uh, or one that works, or one that's clean. Uh, I think there's been a massive advertising campaign to convince us that if we drink this or that brand of bottled water, we'll be healthier or sexier or more popular with the local, you know, with our local community or, or whatever. Uh, all of those reasons are reasons I think people drink bottled, more and more bottled water these days. Um, I also, in preparation for speaking to you, uh, was looking at your 2000 report, which is uh, a series of papers titled uh, Waste Not, Want Not, um, really focused on conservation and all of the major effects that were possible, up to a third of our freshwater use could be, in fact, um, conserved. This is a piece of a very important puzzle. Uh, there's more and more conflict over water resources. There's more and more scarcity of natural fresh water, in part because populations are growing, our economies are growing, the demand for water grows. 
Water's badly distributed around the world. We have water rich areas and water poor areas. The Western United States is water scarce compared to much of the rest of the world. And we are running up against limits of natural supply. In many places, I would argue we take too much water out of our natural ecosystems and that leads to ecosystem collapse, it leads to fisheries death, it leads to conflict over water in the, in the Delta in California, which is a serious political conflict. And if there is no more supply, if there is no more really renewable supply that we can tap into, which is increasingly the case, we argue, then part of our challenge is going to be rethinking the way we use water, to be rethinking the efficiency and productivity that we put water uh, of the uses to which we put water to now. And one of the things we've studied extensively at the Institute, and one of the things we argue is that we can do a lot of the things that we already do. We can grow food, we can wash our clothes, we can have water for drinking and for cooking. We can, we can have water for getting rid of our wastes. But that almost all of the things that we do require less water than we spend to do them. Everything we do requires water, but... It, almost everything. everything we do requires water, but yes. less than we spend to do it. Yes. And that's the idea of efficiency. That was the idea of this report, Waste Not Want Not, that looked at urban efficiency potential in California. How can we do the things we want to do in our cities with less water? And we've done similar work in the agricultural sector. How can we grow more food with less water? Uh, the answer is there's enormous potential to reduce the wasteful use of water. As to much do, so in the agricultural sector? As much in the agricultural sector as in the urban sector. And they are, what proportion, more. they are much larger of the total proportion of water use, the agricultural sector is two thirds? In, in California, uh, probably 70 or 80% yes. of the water that we use goes to agriculture. And, and frankly, it's 70 to 80% worldwide. Uh, agriculture is critically important. It takes a lot of water to grow food, but much of the water that's used in agriculture is used wastefully and inefficiently. I saw a documentary recently about farmers in central California. The almonds are getting smaller, the cherries are getting smaller, and they complain about the fresh water that's getting diverted to the delta. To some, I, don't, I don't really understand how f diverting fresh water to the delta um, offsets seawater um, rise, uh, and perhaps you do, but uh, you know, sure, I, so I see that that's a big issue. So in California, uh, much of the water that we use in both northern and southern California comes from two major rivers, the Sacramento River, which drains northern California, and the San Joaquin River, which drains central California. And those two rivers join together in the Delta, the Bay Delta, which is, we've all driven through it if you live in California. Uh, it's the heart of California's natural ecosystems. It's the water that flows out the, into San Francisco Bay and out the Golden Gate, it originates in the Sacramento and the San Joaquin Rivers. And over the last hundred years, we've diverted more and more of that water out of the Delta for the aqueduct system, for the cities of Southern California and Northern California, for the farms in the Central Valley. And the ecosystem of the Delta has suffered. The fisheries are dying, the salmon are going extinct. Uh, it's it's a, a, the center, really, of the conflict over water in California. So we're trying now to restore some of those ecosystems in the Delta. We're trying to restore some of the natural flows to the Delta. But that requires rethinking the way we provide water for farmers and for the cities in Southern California. And it's really the central part of the big fight over water here. And how is Jerry Brown handling it? Well, Jerry Brown's solution is to build more big infrastructure. Uh, he's proposing that we build uh, something called, uh, originally I guess it was called the Peripheral Canal, now they're talking about a Delta Bypass, perhaps a set of tunnels, to move water more directly from the northern part of the Sacramento River around the Delta, so that it bypasses the Delta. Uh, there are serious problems with taking water directly out of the Delta. It's, it's not completely clear to me that the proposal to bypass the Delta uh, is going to really restore the ecosystems of the Delta. It partly depends on how big that thing we build is, how much it costs, who pays for it, how it's operated, how much water is diverted uh, from Northern California. It, it gets back to the same old problem we've always had here, which is how efficiently are we doing the things we want to do and who really has their hand on the spigot. And can you elaborate on how that efficiency is achieved? Sure, in, in our urban 
centers in our cities, in our industry and residential use and commercial use. We use water for a lot of different things. We use water to make semiconductors. We use water at home to flush our toilets and wash our clothes and to cook and to clean and to water our lawns. Uh, in commercial buildings, we use water in outdoor landscaping and we use it for commercial processes. And all of those uses are inefficient. So for example, uh, before 1990, the average toilet in California used six gallons every time we flushed it. The most efficient, uh, the most efficient toilets today use 1.3 gallons every time we flush them or less. I have a wonderful toilet in my home. It's the best toilet I've ever had that uses 1.1 gallons every time we flush it. That's an incredible improvement in efficiency. It's doing the same thing with a lot less water. My front loading washing machine uses less energy, less water and less detergent to do a better job than the old top loading washing machines. I've gotten rid of the lawn in my house. I have a beautiful garden, but it's native plants. It's low water using plants. It uses much less water than the typical lawn in California where much of our water is wasted, I would argue. Uh, those are examples of things that we can do with less water in California. It's an example of improving productivity. And, in, and we think that we could use a third less water in the urban part of California and still do all of the things we want. That's a tremendous savings of energy and money and what should those things be mandated? How we do that is, is, a, is a question of policy. Uh, I think certain things should be mandated. I think certain things should be left to the market. I think certain things will happen if we simply educate people. Uh, I'm a fan of multiple tools to solve these problems. I don't think there's any one technology or any one policy that will solve our water problems. Um, we have at the national level, appliance efficiency standards that mandate the efficiency of washing machines and toilets and shower heads. And that's a, that's a good thing. Um, I don't think we should mandate that people shouldn't have lawns, but I think if people want to have lawns, they should pay the real economic cost of having those lawns. They should pay much more for the water than they currently pay. And then people will think differently about their, their gardens. They'll think about their their options if their pocketbooks are affected. The, the truth is we pay a lot less for water than we pay for our cell phones or our cable TV or our energy bill or, uh, or almost any other of our public utilities. And yet, of all of those things, I would argue water is probably the most valuable to us. And agriculturally, how would you achieve those efficiencies? So for agriculture, we can irrigate more efficiently with drip irrigation rather than uh, sprinklers or with sprinklers rather than old style flood irrigation. And that by itself enormously reduces the amount of water that's used to grow the same kinds of crops. We could also change the kinds of crops that we grow in California. And we are doing that. Uh, we used to grow extensively field crops, cotton, alfalfa, irrigated pasture, things that take a lot of water but don't produce a lot of revenue for farmers. And in the last couple of decades, we've been moving from those kinds of water intensive crops to nuts and fruits that, that take less water, that can be irrigated with efficient drip irrigation, and that produce much more revenue for farmers. Uh, in California, farm income has grown enormously in the last two decades, and farm water use has leveled off. Uh, that's an example of increased productivity. Farmers are doing much more with the water that they're already using, but the potential to do more is still enormous. So let's talk about distribution, about the billion people on the planet without access to fresh water. Um, how does the Pacific Institute address that? So this is one of the biggest water problems we face. There are a billion people worldwide that don't have access to safe water and sanitation. Uh, that's something that you and I take completely for granted. We turn on the tap and safe water comes out at an incredibly low cost. But that's not true for a significant fraction of the world's population. Uh, there are two and a half billion people worldwide that don't have access to adequate sanitation services. Uh, that's a water crisis. That's a serious problem. And I think that needs to be addressed at, with much more urgency than the world community has really been addressing it so far. And how can we go about doing that? Well, it's not a question of inventing new technology. We know how to meet basic human needs for water. It's not really, in my opinion, a question of economics. 
Uh, it doesn't require a whole lot of water, uh, of money, to meet those water needs. The, the truth is if we diverted even a fraction of the amount of water we spend on bottled water, we could meet basic human needs for water easily. And there are economic costs of failing to meet those needs through ill health, uh, through the hours that young women primarily in Africa have to spend m walking many kilometers to collect water for their families. Uh, that prevents them from going to school or from participating in the economic activities of their community. Uh, so we need, to, we need to build basic water systems. We need to work with local communities at the local level to figure out what their needs are and their expertise is and to satisfy their needs. Uh, sometimes it's just a question of opening up new markets and, and bringing innovative approaches to communities that, that really want to help solve their, their water, water problems. Is the technology there? It's not a question of new technology. The technology exists. Uh, maybe it's a question of matching appropriate technology with appropriate need. Uh, in the old days, we would think, all right, everybody's got to do what we have to do, what we've already done. We have to build centralized water treatment systems and centralized distribution plants. Uh, I don't think that's appropriate technology. That might be appropriate for certain parts of the world. But there are small-scale solutions as well, community-scale water systems. And matching the scale of the solution to the scale of the problem, rather than inventing some new silver bullet technology, I, th I think can go a long way to solving these problems. When you say market solutions, would you ever advocate uh, making water a commodity like oil or um, you know, something that people have to pay for? Okay, so this is a big debate in the water community. We've done a lot of work on the human right to water. I was one of the first advocates for a human right to water. And the UN has now declared that water is a human right for basic human needs and for sanitation. And that's a wonderful thing. But the con conflict is that water is also an economic good. I pay for my water services and I ought to pay for my water services. Maybe the water should be free, but the, the piping, the, the high quality treatment that I get, the removal of wastes from my house, those are services that I ought to pay for. Uh, and I ought to pay the full cost of those services because if I don't, it's the ecosystems that tend to suffer. Um, so balancing the human right to water and the economic costs and value of water is part of the challenge. Uh, I would argue that poor communities in Africa pay for water already through ill health or through, as I've already said, the fact that poor the girls have to walk miles and don't get to go to school because they have to bring water to their communities. So balancing that human right to water and the economic value of water is a, is a challenge for us. But I don't believe that private companies should own water. Uh, like that's, Cochabamba? That's the privatization debate that I think is, is pretty clear. Would you like to Cochabamba. talk about Cochabamba? For well, Cochabamba, is it, Cochabamba Brazil, uh, uh, Bolivia is a good example of uh, bad efforts at privatization of water. It was a, it's a, a community in Bolivia, the third largest city in Bolivia. Uh, there was an effort on, by the World Bank and some private water companies to privatize the water system there. Um, and the local community objected, and they objected with public uh, protests uh, that were ignored, and then there were riots and people were killed. And it was a good example of how strongly people feel about public control of water resources. And the, I, I think there's an ability to meet public needs for water with public systems. Most of the water systems in the U.S. are public water systems because the private companies in the 1800s completely failed to provide water for, for local communities. Uh, that's, that's part of the debate that we're having in the water world. So the Pacific Institute also focuses on globalization issues beyond water? We do. Uh, mostly focused on water. Uh, mostly exploring the way that we can meet basic human needs for water, uh, we can get corporations to be more responsible about water. We, we actually have a program that's working very extensively trying to develop standards for corporate reporting on water, for corporate respons social responsibility around water. Um, corporations use a lot of water. Uh, they can be a force for good or they can be a force for bad. And I don't think corporations are going to go away. And if there's a way to make them more responsible, uh, that can be a very powerful force. But the pressures about globalization on environmental issues broadly, on water, on energy, on climate change, uh, are some of the greatest challenges in the 21st century. It seems that water relates to energy in very intimate ways. Uh, they're almost like electricity and magnetism, they sort of go together. 
They do go together. Uh, we use a tremendous amount of water to produce the energy that we use for power plant cooling, for, uh, for mining, for even washing solar panels. Uh, and at the same time, we use a tremendous amount of energy to produce, to collect and produce and treat and distribute the water that we use. It turns out a lot of the energy we use in our homes is energy that goes to heating water that we use, to making hot water. Uh, figuring out that energy water nexus, figuring out how to produce more energy with less water and to produce more water with less energy uh, is a new challenge. We haven't really thought about those things together before. We've thought about them separately, um, but we ought to think about them separate. We ought to think about them together. The example I gave a, a couple of minutes ago about washing machines, my, my front loading washing machine, it uses less energy and it uses less water. It's a good example of a technology that, that if properly implemented, can help us save both of those resources. And it's something that everybody can do. It's something that everybody can do. Uh, there is another piece to this puzzle, and that is water and energy are both connected to climate change. Um, climate change is a real problem. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a climatologist and a hydrologist by training, and a lot of the work that we've done at the Institute looks at the impacts of climate change on water resources. And there's no doubt that First of all, the climate's changing, and there's no doubt that humans are, are responsible, and there's no doubt that water resources will be very significantly affected by climate change. Changes in temperature, increases in temperature means more demand for water. Uh, there are going to be changes in precipitation patterns. There are going to be changes in the frequency and the intensity of, of floods and droughts. And that's tied to the energy system as well. Energy is, the way we use energy is responsible for the emissions of greenhouse gases. So energy, water, and climate are all related. They're all tied. And that's why you have to look at these problems together. Looking yes. at them in isolation doesn't solve them. Yes. I remember reading that Pakistan and India, I think it was Pakistan has some of the most fertile fields in the world, but the, uh, the uh, headwaters of India feed them. And that uh, in the future, the, the, there could be, you know, these are both nuclear powers. Uh, you know, there could be a very uh, unfortunate dispute over that water. Yes, that's right. One of the first problems that the Pacific Institute ever addressed was environmental security, looking at conflicts over resource issues. Uh, one of the most important resource issues that is directly tied to conflict is fresh water. There's a long history of conflict over water resources, going back 5,000 years. And we actually maintain a chronology of water conflicts at a website that we, we keep up called worldwater.org, called the Water Conflict Chronology. And India and Pakistan have a long history of conflict and tension over the Indus River. Kashmir is a con contended resource area between India and Pakistan, and there's a water component to that dispute. Uh, we'd better figure out how to manage our water resources peacefully rather than in conflict, or those conflicts are going to get worse. So what papers are you working on right now? Well, we're doing still a lot of work on water and energy. We do a lot of work on water efficiency and productivity. Uh, we've just released a new book on a 21st century U.S. water policy, uh, making recommendations to the federal government for how, uh, at the federal level, we could manage our water more carefully and more effectively and more sustainably. Uh, we're doing work in Indonesia to help local communities develop SMS systems for their phones, for their cell phones, to report on water problems to local utilities and to community activist groups so that they can be more effective at making sure that their water resources are safe uh, and reliable. Uh, we're doing work on climate change and adaptation in India. Uh, we're working on a smartphone app that lets people find the nearest public drinking water fountain or map a, a drinking water fountain to an open source database so that we can cut the use of bottled water. If you don't know where you can get free drinking water, then it's easier to think, oh, I have to go buy a bottle of water. Uh, but if you know where the nearest drinking water fountain is, uh, maybe you can avoid that purchase. And so we're developing a smartphone app to do that. And they're getting harder to find. They're getting harder to find, but there is a little bit of a renaissance in drinking water fountains. Uh, the water companies have realized that people are beginning to carry refillable bottles, and they're making drinking water fountains that can be refilled. There's a, one, a new one at the at the, in the United Terminal at the San Francisco airport. Um, you see them more and more, and I, I'm hopeful that there will be a renaissance in public drinking water fountains. Well, Dr. Glick, we've got about a minute left. Um, how could a viewer help the Pacific Institute? Do, do you uh, need volunteer labor? Uh, 
Do you well, take donations on your website? We are, we're a nonprofit. We always take donations. Uh, we're always looking for financial support for the things that we do, but we're also looking for smart people to work with. We're looking for innovative groups to work with. Uh, collaboration is an important part of what we do. Uh, we're working with this group in Indonesia, we're working in India with local community groups and in Africa with groups, and we're working domestically with groups. Um, our publications are available for free on our website. Uh, people who are interested in these issues are encouraged to come and, and take a look at the kinds of things that we've done. And I would encourage individuals to get involved in their local water stories. They can get involved with their local water utilities. They can run for water board. They can vote on water issues or write letters or, or work with NGOs working domestically or, or internationally. There are lots of ways to get involved in, in addressing environmental issues and especially water issues. Oh, good. All right, Dr. Glick, well, thank you very much for coming here and speaking about this um, really fundamental and very important issue. Thank you for having me. All right. And thank you for joining us. Good night.